Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where we talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft on the full and new moon every month. In this episode, I'm talking to Appalachian witch Andrea. We talked about dreaming of spirit horses, unintentional childhood spellcasting, and she gets me to reveal the real reason I do this podcast. Before we get to her interview, I would like to ask a favor of you. I would really like to make this podcast better, and with your help, I might be able to. If you go to the link in the show notes and write a little note about why you like this podcast, and then go to your email and verify it, I could win seed money to improve the show. This contest is through Podcash and is open to small podcasts who have received less than $10,000 in sponsorships. And yes, share this with your other podcaster friends. My goal is to buy a better portable recording system instead of the two lavalier mics that I'm using. So when I do things like record on site at Anahata's Purpose or at a pagan pride fest or I do other in-person interviews, I'm able to have better sound quality. I think we really appreciate your support. That said, now let's get to the stories. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Cam. Great to be here. I'm so honored you're having me. Would you please introduce yourself and let people know who you are and where they can find you? Absolutely. I am Andrea. Hey, everyone. I am just your average witch, and uh, I hail from the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. You can find me on my socials um, over on Instagram as Andrea of Appalachia, and also on Vero, which I'm very new to, but enjoying the free space there, also as Andrea of Appalachia. I keep forgetting Vero exists. I I occasionally do as well, but I really hope (laughs) that it drums up some hype soon because uh, some of the other platforms are kind of crazy right now with scammers and all sorts of stuff. (laughs) So what does it mean to you when you call yourself a witch? It's kind of a loaded question. Um, Honestly, I don't really associate with the word. It has what? historically had. <laughs> I I use it. I use it. It's historically. What are you doing here? How, how dare you? <laughs> some negative connotations, right? Like, stop trying to make witch happen. Hmm. I I don't associate it with myself, but the word which associates itself with me, if that makes any sense, it's kind of a label that fits what I do and who I am. Um, But in terms of the historical references, like doesn't really make me comfortable. Um, It's kind of like, you know, the word bitch, right? Like that's not always a comfortable word, depending on whose mouth it comes out of. It's the same thing. So for me, um, what a witch would be to me, if I were to call myself that, maybe, I don't know, uh, mystic, um, perhaps energy bender, I don't know, childlike wonder. Um, that That's what that word would really be more like for me, as opposed to the word witch. Although... I am coming to terms with liking it more because there's such a positive uh, world out there right now. And a view of it still makes me a little leery, especially living in a very red Mm -hmm. town. (laughs) That's interesting. I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, I, I love witches and movies and books my whole life but it's like oh my gosh what if I put that out there and then one day the world loses its freaking mind and Mm -hmm. I'm stuck on a mountain and I'm surrounded by everybody with bibles and I'm gone (laughs) that's it I'm done toast pitchforks I've thought about that fires (laughs) so I don't know maybe that's just you know my little shadow working hurdle to jump over I've heard some beautiful responses on all sorts of different interviews out there. And do I feel I fit what society is labeling, which, yeah, 100%. Does the word feel comfortable coming out of my mouth? Um, No, not 100%. It's more empowering these days, I would say, right now with this upheaval 
of new witches and witches coming out and people finding their paths, but still not 100% comfortable with it being the title I'd call myself. I don't know that I really like labels. That's probably my issue. That was going to be my question. Do you have anything that you call yourself? And and no is an okay (laughs) answer. (laughs) Awesome is usually what I call myself. Um, I approve of that. (laughs) (laughs) So do you have any daily practices? And if so, would you share them? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I would say every day I get up and I do some kind of glamour magic, Um, whether that's, you know, weaving intentions into my hair, setting my tone for the day, dressing myself a certain way and putting on that kind of protection that I need for the day. I'm huge on jewelry and talismans. I will always select something for whatever mission I'm going into that day. I actually put on a pyrite mirror that I have and I use often when I want to reflect things away from me. And uh, this was just about like two weeks ago. And I was doing a meditation practice and working on my clairs. And the first thing this gal picked up on was some kind of shiny flat oval stone. And I was like, oh man, she saw my protection. She can't see it, but she saw it. So of course I was like, anointing oil, let me get this fixed right away because you need to be also invisible. Um, So I would say that's definitely a daily kind of witchy habit. Um, Also, I light incense and candles, sometimes provide offerings to my house and land spirits. They are very important to me. And... So I just want to show my appreciation, a couple moments of mindfulness and celebration that we're in this together. Um, Some daily, or that's my daily, so some weekly practices, I would say, would include things like house cleansing. That's a really big thing for me, Um, literally sweeping out some of that energy from the week that I no longer need, walking in the woods at least once a week grounding myself that way is very important, kind of releasing myself from the touches of technology and internet because there's physically no Wi-Fi in the woods. No cell service either. It's great. Now now my stalkers and serial killers can find me. Let's see what else. I say self-care at least once a week in my sacred space is important. That's kind of a newer addition I've done in the last few years is I am my most important tool in my practice. So taking care of myself in my space is also building that energy and cleansing my space and myself. It's that extension of me. So that's really important. But yeah, those are just a few things that I could say I consistently do. There's lots of things I randomly do, but those are my consistent ones. (laughs) When you do offerings to the land spirits, do you do it outside? Because I can't, I don't feel like I can do them in the house. Currently I do them on the deck. I am working this upcoming warm weather season on a ancestral garden that I will Mm. have there. So I'm really excited about this project. Um, I feel like that's going to be really like the, hey, I'm here. I'm listening. I'm all for you. Um, Stop hiding behind trees and just be here with me. Now I want to do it. I want an ancestral garden now. What the heck? (laughs) I, um, yeah, I've been really looking into various plants that already grow here, transplanting them specifically there. I've been collecting some logs, um, that have fallen and been there for years, covered in moss, little ferns tucked in their crevasses. And, uh, yeah, I kind of like where it's going, but since I've moved here, we only lived here just over a year, I'm really letting everything around me on the land and in the house guide me so I don't have the full picture yet because they haven't disclosed it 
Yeah, that's how I, it took me, like, I feel like I'm only just now figuring stuff out and we've been here two years. Well, you have to kind of see the full cycles, right? Like, yeah, you can go in guns blazing, but inevitably it will die. And if you say that you're not going to go in guns blazing and then buy 300 lavender plants, I don't know anything about this, but I've heard some things. Oh, me neither. Me super (laughs) not. (laughs) Those lavender plants are going to die. I'm just letting you know because you made a pact and you should have watched and been yep. very patient. So, so is your lime quat tree. Oh, Your lime gosh. quat tree is going to die. Yeah. All and of probably it. your mandarin too. Uh, I feel this so much in my deep well, speaking earthy bones. Of, speaking of ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of ancestors do you have any family history with what we're not going to call witches but with mysticism and witchcraft oh we can call it witchcraft get me comfortable kim do it i don't have family history i was raised in catholicism my mother and i well we were catholic and my two brothers my sister and my father were methodist so kind of a divided family. I don't know. My mother wanted to make sure I was christened as the first child in Catholicism. She thought it was a very beautiful religion. As the years have spawned on, perhaps maybe not so much. But we do casually joke about it. There are some things she still holds sacred, but not not witchy. I've had recent conversations with her regarding some experiences I had. And she kind of word vomited on me. I wasn't expecting it. I'm the least likely to need to talk to my mom child out of the four of us. So I was like, look, I got something going on. I need to talk to you about it. Here was my crazy experience. Um, And she's like, oh, okay. So this has happened to me a little over a handful of times. And uh, you and your brother, your entire lives have had this thing where you see things and you know things, and it kind of scared the crap out of me, but... That um, frustrates <laughs> me when they don't tell you things like that. <laughs> like, hello, maybe I would want to know that. Yeah, I mean, and as soon as she said it in my head, it clicked. I was like, oh yeah, you mean like when my brother was three years old and put his hands on your belly while we were talking and you're doing the dishes, and he's like, shh, everybody, I can hear the baby, and then you found out you're pregnant two days later? Yeah, that time, like, you didn't want to share, like... <laughs> that happens around here. (laughs) I don't know. So yeah, there's some things there, but nothing, nothing really family history wise, you know, my dad's side of the family, all very Christian settlers from Appalachia. My grandfather was a, you know, a reverend's son. So not anything there that I'm aware of. And if there was any kind of folk magic in there, my grandfather was very, salty about his past and upbringing. So that never was passed down. I did have some influences growing up though. So one of my first, you know, kind of witchy moments, I was 10 years old and I had a best friend who I didn't really know why she was my best friend because everybody in class liked her. And I was the chubby kid that everybody picked on. I was the castaway. And somehow she just clicked with me, adopted me under her wing. I'd go over and play dolls. She had three older brothers that I totally crushed on. They were talented artists and gorgeous. And I was like, oh my gosh, I could come here every day. I can't believe these people are accepting me in their lives. One day I walked in and there was this big blue mat on the dining room table. And it had like celestial things all over it. I didn't know what I was looking at. And there was a stack of cards. Again, didn't know what I was looking at. And so my friend at 10 is like, oh, yeah, my mom reads fortunes. And I'm like, your mom reads fortunes? Like, this is crazy. Her <laughs> mom her mom casually walks That's in from exactly the kitchen. That's what I would have sounded like if I said it. I was like, what is happening here? You know, there's some crystals. And I'm like, this is amazing. These, this is not just in the movies. This is a thing. This is life. I would have gotten pretty shrill. (laughs) Oh, man. It was something. And she was gorgeous Latina woman. She had, you know, 
dark jet black hair. She was always done up red lipstick. Her power colors were very obviously red and purple. That's all I ever saw her in. Maybe sometimes hot pink or lime, but like those were her dominant colors. And as time went on, like the whole family was just like, you're very, you know, Giannina, my friend, your friend is very special. And I'm like, what the hell is special about me? I'm just this chubby kid that nobody likes, but okay. And I just remember like just being totally embraced by these people and not knowing what's going on, but being mystified by them. Total traveler vibes. Don't know where every time I run into them, I don't expect it because it is not in the same place where as I left them. So and I miss them dearly. Um, so shortly after that, I was 12 and I had a very, I don't know, maybe it was hormones. I don't know what possessed me. I still have no idea to this day, but I did my first spell not knowing I was doing my first spell and I threw bones not knowing I was throwing bones. Oh. <laughs> So I was pretty frustrated, normal 12-year-old stuff. Uh, My new best friend in, you know, middle school, I had told her who my crush was, and she went after him and started dating him, you know, holding hands in the hallway. And I was so pissed. I was like, why does this keep happening? So in this fit of hormonal, emotional, crazy chaos going on, I did my first spell and I think a lot of us kind of find ourselves in that space. What possessed me to do the things? I have no idea, but yeah, I threw bones. I was like, just tell me when they're going to break up because this will never last. And I put it on the calendar or I guess back in those days, the school gave you like one of those agenda planners and I just like made a tiny notation, put a little X in there, forgot about it, forgot about it. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks later, the news broke that they broke up and everybody in school was talking about it. And I went flipping through that agenda planner and was like, holy heck, holy heck, I can do this. So here I'm just like, all right, terrified. Holy cow, I can tell the future. I'm like my friend's mom. I need to step away from this. So when I was 13, it just seemed to be like a succession of incidences walking me down this path. So when I was 13, I played softball for many years and I went over to a friend's house from the team and she introduced me to Silver Raven Wolf and Raymond Buckland, which were her mother's books. I had no idea what I was doing. I was totally engaged. I was ready for it. And she walked me down to the creek behind her house and we left offerings of sugar in exchange for little rocks and crystals that we found. And I was like, I'm here for this. So from that day on, I never ate a school lunch because I saved all of my cash to walk across the street after school over to a big bookstore and sit in their tiny occult new age section, which was, I think, two shelves at the time and spent all my money on books. I got my first book, which was by Silver Raven Wolf. And that one was um, Teen Witch. The second one was to ride a silver broomstick. And then everything fell in after that. But I I think reading the introduction was what really was like, okay, you knew what you were doing all these years back to the day when you were making potions in the playhouse and the Christian kids next door were like, we can't do that with you. And I was like, no, we're just, it's just play. <laughs> like, you know what you're doing. So let's do this. And that's kind of how I came into it. Did you have to hide the books? Oh, yes. Or did your family not get into your stuff? Oh, oh I did. Um, because my mother is a master at finding things out. Like I have very young siblings that are 13 and 16 years younger than me. So, and my parents had started their own business at this time. So they were gone a lot and I didn't go into like parties or social gatherings way later until college. So I would sit in my room when those kids finally went to bed and I'd sit in my window seat, which my parents built and there were doors underneath of it and the speaker set inside there that I also got when I was 13 and so I would wrap those books in like you know book paper like you would your textbooks in school 
Yeah. And so I could carry them to school so I wouldn't leave them behind. But when I was home, I don't know, I thought my mom was going to like creep in, pull my stereo out in the middle of the night. I'm not really sure. But I would put them behind the stereo. So anything I didn't want them to know would go behind that stereo. My, I have to wonder if that's a witch knowing or it's just a mom thing because my mom knew I was pregnant. Like basically before I knew I was pregnant. Um, it could be both. I mean, you guys are linked by DNA. There's yeah. I mean, I know she's got some witchy stuff going on, but <laughs> I mean, some stuff that is not. I know it's not mom stuff because <laughs> it's, it's that weird. it's, it's just that penial. It's that pineal gland, right? Like, sometimes we don't choose to exercise it. It exercises us. <laughs> so maybe they, other people get afraid of it. I don't know. Does your partner practice? Um, My partner, my husband, he uh, is a longtime practitioner of PC game spirituality. Uh, so we have different paths. He's got a whole shrine, maybe a temple on the first floor. He's more of a game guy. Not really hmm. a practicing of witchcraft. But I think that helps our relationship when um, he travels a lot for work, too. He really enjoys his online community that he's been part of for years. So it gives me the space to, you know, shake it up in my loft doing my magical things. Um, and because he's around things like trolls and uh, elves and wizards all day online, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think he's okay with it. And he's joined in on quite a few things that I was surprised about. I mean, sometimes he'll just be like, are you going to put your crystals out for the moon? I'm like, yeah, nah, I mean, the girls just aren't feeling it this time or He'll ask if we're doing something for a sabbat, or he was really, really into finding our house, our our forever home. So that meant a lot. Um, we've done some workings for new jobs and things like that together. So I think he does have sometimes a skeptical eye more so because it scares him <laughs> when things mm. happen. <laughs> But if that's real, what else is real? <laughs> right. Right? Uh, yeah. Definitely. What would you say your best or worst witchcraft experience was? And how does it change your practice now? Ooh. Or affect it? I would say uh, there really are no worst experiences. They're sometimes scary. And you once you've molded down or made anything explode. Okay. I, I should have started with it. I did set myself on fire once I got into candles and all of this stuff. And then I actually lit myself on fire in front of my brother. And I had a Gosh. hole in the front of my chest. It was fine. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to show off. And then I never did that again. But haven't we all lit ourselves on fire? Like, isn't that like a rite of passage in witchcraft? No, she stands Have I alone. Lit myself okay. On fire? I'm thinking. <laughs> I know I burn a lot of stuff. I don't know if it's been myself. I've burned my fingertips because I hold stuff in the flame. <laughs> mm, yeah. Now I have jewelers, jewelers, uh, tweezers. So <laughs> sometimes we learn. Jewelers, What's tweezers. The best one? Um, I They're would cross clamp say... tweezers. They're great. Oh, I would love that. I came by way a set of hemostats don't ask uh from a hospital don't ask but <laughs> they were fantastic i use them for everything and i really miss those suckers let's see uh best experience overall i there are so many it goes hand in hand with your worst experience because you're always learning in the craft there's never uh a there can be a lull, but there's never a moment that I don't look back and think, oh my gosh, these are related and then feel better about it. So I guess for an example, a best and worst combination that I could talk about was I, oh, it was just uh, this past winter solstice 
And just a couple days before, I had been in my workshop working on my Claire's. And as the days grew closer to solstice, I didn't really put it hand in hand. This is just a time frame. I was getting so insanely tense in my neck, in my shoulders. And I thought, okay, you're just feeling this holiday heat. We're coming out of the holidays. Your mother-in-law was here. We know what that does. Just chill out. And then it became even more unbearable. And I was like, literally like something is in this house and I'm cleansing this house. I'm like, it's got to be standing on my shoulders. It's like one of those ghost stories I read when I was a kid and they found out that there was like some kind of ghost sitting on someone's shoulders, scrunching their neck for years. And that's why they ended up crooked. Like this is happening. This is happening here. And I'm freaking out. So I find no Advil was helping. Nothing was helping. I put some mugwort on my neck this incredible balm that I love. And is it by Prairie Fire Herbal? Oh, heck yes, it is. It is my favorite. And I was like, girl, why did you wait so long to put this on? You know better. Like you've got this in every drawer on every floor for this reason. So I put it on feeling good for two hours. Then the pain come back. I put it back on. Two hours goes by, pain comes back. I put it back on. I'm just exhausted by this pain. And I forgot to wash my hands and I touched my mouth. And I was like, oh, my lips are tingly. What is happening? Oh my God, mugwort in my mouth. What's happening? (laughs) So (laughs) I go to bed early. I fall asleep on the couch. I am knocked out. Like you could have given me a Benadryl or any other, I don't know what knocks you out drugs because I I don't take them, but one of those. And it was very hard to wake me up. My husband said, I came upstairs. I didn't do my normal evening ritual of a shower and cleansing off my day. Oh, that's another daily one. I just like jumped in bed, which is beside me. I have a fear of skin flakes. It's weird. Oh, me Um, too. (laughs) I'm not into it. Saw that one science video where they like eat you on your mascara Keyboard. and your sheets. Ah, oh my God. No, it is not. No. Like it was oh unusual <laughs> for me to get in bed knowing skin flakes might eat my soul. And I remember looking at the clock and my husband had gotten to bed around 11 and I started dreaming and having this really pleasant dream. And I'm standing on our back deck and I'm looking into the woods and I see this beautiful brown horse And it's just kind of peeking out of the tree line and it has an aura that is fuchsia. And I'm like, oh, it's on. This Claire exercises I've been doing is on. I am seeing auras. This is happening. I need to go and practice like right now and keep seeing auras. This is great. And I go to turn and now I'm suddenly on my front deck, but my back is facing the ground, which is like a 20 foot drop. And I can hear very loud, audible footsteps running up behind me, crunching the leaves as it gets closer. And then there's nothing. And then it's latched on my back. And now, you get this? I don't like it. (laughs) Oh, you don't like it. (laughs) I didn't like it either. The next thing I knew, I was in my bed. My eyes were open. I couldn't move. I was in complete like sleep paralysis. And I could feel the claws on my right shoulder and just below, like a foot, right below my right rib cage. And I was rocking back and forth and I could hear it breathing and I could see my husband asleep. And I am like murmuring, trying to get him to wake up and he's stirring, but he is not waking. And the left hand of whatever this was moves my hair back from my face and pulls it down my back and I was like well shit we're here we are journeying this is happening we're tripping on mugwort and we got to figure out what's going on so I tell myself you have to fight this you're stronger than this the horse was here that was a good omen get your shit together and then it was gone And I could roll over. I could breathe. I'm out of breath, but I can breathe. I sit up, take a glass of water. And I'm like, wow, I cannot forget this. And I'm running through the whole thing in my mind. And I lay back down. I'm like, I need to go back to sleep. My body needs the rest, but I don't want to forget this. And I hear knocking at the door on the first floor, which is two floors below me. 
And I was like, okay, we're going to write this down. We cannot forget this. Something is happening and it's solstice. What the hell is happening? So I start typing it up in the notes section of my phone. And then I hear the knocking again. Sound like it was like at our detached garage. And I'm like, okay, this is really happening. Like, you can't make this up. This is happening. So I'm writing, 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 fiercely writing. And then I hear it further away, like at the neighbor's front door. And they're about an acre away, but we're in the middle of nowhere. So you can hear this stuff sometimes when it's really quiet and the wind is really still. I was still kind of shaken, but I felt like I'd gotten enough out in my notes that I could go back to sleep and be okay. But I told my husband the next morning and he was like having an outer body in front of me. (laughs) And I was like, no, no, no. I think it was just a traveler. You know, opportunity knocks. I was not the opportunity. I think it shows that we've got good strength here. Good parameters. It's gone. I don't feel it here. Nobody's telling me around here. It's still here. But holy heck, that just happened. (laughs) So that's like a good balance of, hey, it can sometimes be terrifying, but in the end, hey, I made that happen. I'm I'm powerful enough I can do yeah, it and I can channel cool. it. It's, it's, that's fucking horrible, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's like a recent example. I can't think of anywhere where things went awry. Um, I can't think of anything where I was just like I mean, another best, I guess, could be, I guess, you know, a lot of us have been in relationships that probably weren't the greatest for us at some point in our lives. If you haven't yet, you may in the future. But I was in a particularly not so great situation and I went to go live in North Carolina and stay with some family while it settled down. and. I had just, before all this slid up, like the 4th of July, been asked to marry this person. And so I had a ring on my finger. My family was not for it. I don't even think I was really for it, but I was just like latching on to like those good moments with the person. So wearing it, because I just was so torn. And I was just having this struggle feeling like out of touch with everything. I'm in a new place and I really didn't feel grounded where I was. I I couldn't, you know, so I just did this like quick ritual in the bathroom where my family members wouldn't see me, really had no materials or tools, just did what I do meditation wise, listening wise. And, and then I just audibly was so angry that this energy came out and was like, just give me a sign. And I started crying. And, uh, got myself together. Can't walk out there in front of the family and be like, here I am crying again. And I turned the knob and went to walk out and hit my ring on the door and looked down and this quote unquote diamond was broken in half. And I said, okay, Mm. thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate (laughs) that. And so I, yeah, I went up and stayed in Massachusetts to get even further away and distance myself and get out of that situation. So there we are. What do you most want out of your practice? And what is your biggest biggest motivator in your practice? What I want most out of my practice is to really gain control, to be able to hold the reins of all of my clairs and not to have fear to use them. It's really a huge push for me right now Because since moving to this place where it's so quiet, I hear and I see a lot more than I have in my entire lifetime. But sometimes I don't want to hear and see it in the bathroom, as you may know. (laughs) I, I, I want to be able to tune it out, but also tune it in. And so that is something that's motivating me right now because there is so much activity and they need to be heard to pass on is what I've been told. And uh, there's four of them that need this. The rest would like to stay, but I need to be able to figure that out because 
I didn't come here by accident. There, we weren't even looking to move here. We were looking 40 miles west. And we had been to lots of houses out there. We'd been talking to the realtor about it. And I happened to be looking at the map one day and just saw this spot, basically where I'm standing right now, pointed to my husband and said, this is where we need to go. And he's like, are you kidding? That is so far away. That's not close to anything. They may not even have internet. And I was like, no, we'll find something. And he kind of argued, there's no houses. I said, there'll be a house that comes up. And the next thing I know, like two weeks later, this house was coming soon And I had no idea what kind of journey it was going to take us on. And I mean us, because my mother-in-law also told me recently that she's been seeing things when she visits. And I was like, yep, that's Mm. that's a thing. It's happening here. So (laughs) that's, that's my big motivator. I just really, it's really empowering everything I do. I love all of these spirits and energies so much. It is really incredible living as a transient for such a long time, moving with a big corporate entity for so long, and then settling down in our first house, which was our previous one, and then seeing that house get so angry. Well, the day we put it up for showing I mean, that was thousands of dollars. It just broke down out of nowhere. It was throwing a monster-sized temper tantrum. And I realized, like, holy crap, all this time I'd been building this relationship. So once we got that house settled down and happy with the new owners and introduced them to the new owners, I immediately went online to some of my favorite little shops and had stuff that I knew I needed to send our new house and our new land. And it was already waiting when I walked in on the kitchen counter and I was like, welcome everybody immediately. Like welcome me, welcome you. We're friends now here it is. And so it's really super important to me to, to get this relationship like in full fruition. Hmm. What would you say is your biggest struggle when it comes to witchcraft? And do you ever have self doubt or imposter syndrome? I would say the biggest struggle for me, I think, is the labels. We've addressed that some already. And I guess sitting here considering it a little longer, it's because I was solitary for 24 years of my 26-year practice. And I just kind of, I don't know, I didn't think about the internet. (laughs) It was my practice. It was connection with the land. Like it did not even occur to me to go online. Um, it did in my twenties and I got in an AIM chat and that was bogus. And so I left and I never looked back at the internet as a resource or a community ever again. But, you know, 2020 happened and we were all at home and we were all looking outside our box and a lot of people were looking into gardening And so that stuff sold out super fast. And I was like, well, heck, I've been gardening for years, but sorry for you guys. So I needed a new (laughs) hobby. Like the hobbies everybody else was picking up, I didn't have. So I was like, all right, well, let me dive in here. Like podcasts are a thing now, right? So I surfed around a bit. And of course I found Witch Bitch Amateur Hour. And um, I thought Macy and Charlie were hilarious. And I just really appreciated that kind of like friendship sitting by the fire friends and just kind of talking about witchcraft in a way that I'd never really been fully able to, you know, I had always kind of tiptoed around it. There are very few people that I could fully immerse myself in speaking about it with because I was so on an Island by myself. And so coming into that environment, I was like thirsty for more and, listening to other podcasts. And then I was like, oh my gosh, they're, they have to be on socials and I'm looking in socials and everything was fun and exciting. And then it got really overwhelming as more and more people joined. And, um, there were a lot of, you know, repetitive questions. My number one pet peeve is having to repeat myself. So that's my personal problem, (laughs) but 
it was just like a lot of redundancy. Then in 2021, we got heavily into gatekeeping, you know, being an eclectic witch was no longer a thing. And that was like a title I thought I was. Then it was all about, you know, like tests online. Are you a green witch? Are you a gray witch? And there's like all these battles. And then, you know, we have so many struggles with um, appropriation coming out and then having to like readdress those things. And, oh my gosh, do you have a subscription box? And then you're all like sucked into, I need to spend all this money. So it was kind of a whirlwind there for a while with labels of like, what kind of witch was I? And what was I doing? Questioning my practice for about six months. All of a sudden I, I did feel a little bit of the imposter syndrome, everything that I had practiced for decades was like, what were you doing? Even articles that came up questionably about Silver Ravenwolf, like it broke my heart because she birthed a lot of paths for people. And although maybe that's not the path a lot of us are on now, like she's kind of that, that crone for a lot of us. And so, yeah, yeah, it was a lot. But then I remembered I'm a badass witch, not witch. Good. Bitch. <laughs> it was like, you know what? I don't care. And I don't need to be parts of some of these communities. I'm going to find the ones that I really like and support those. And there have been some really beautiful connections. I'm, you know, you are an example of one. You know, I've been seeing Mama Kim for years. And, and then you breaking out That's into your so own weird. podcast. <laughs> is that weird? Right? Like, do you feel like Mama Kim? It's like Mama Cats is what I think Not of. That and that's generally. Mama Cats is badass. So that's what I think of every time I say Mama Kim. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the struggle of labels, the struggle of finding your community, it's tough. I think it's getting better. But really, that was my own work I had to do. And just get the gonads again to say I'm better than what I'm putting up with. And I'm better than the, some of these answers I've been giving. And this person truly needs help. Sure, they can look it up on the internet, but you don't need to be annoyed. Like, let me help you, friend. So it got, it got a little crazy. I don't think that was my energy. I am a Capricorn sun, a Virgo moon. So I'm very grounded. This is not, not my behavior. It was definitely some kind of internet depression <laughs> tornado happening in my world. So how, how do you feel social media affects your practice now? How does it affect my if practice it does. now? I think it affects, I think social media affects my practice in the way that I'm not going in anymore for the most experienced person. That's part of the gatekeeping issues that we're experiencing online. I'm going in for the experiences the person shares. And a lot of people don't like sharing experiences they have, but I think that is so important when finding validation for yourself that there are others having gremlins on their back after seeing a pretty horse in the woods. Um, I, I don't want that one. I'm just saying, you know, um, <laughs> someone, someone else who can talk about a little bit, just share a little bit about if they engage in um, like Anahana's purpose is a good example because so many people walked out of there sharing their experiences. It empowers others to want to be part of it. If it's just, you know, like a solstice celebration, share a little bit of that. What was the magic you shared by yourself or with your partner or with others? Like, tell me when you had a really crazy mugwort trip. Tell me when the tarots are being jerks. <laughs> like, it happens, but being not only solitary most of my life, but now living in a very conservative area on a mountain by myself. Well, you know, my husband's here, but I don't have a lot of people around me um, that have the same way of thinking. So it's important that we support each other in the community. And I look for that now more than ever, as opposed to 
looking at the followers or how many cool crystals they have posted on their Instagram. I'm looking for the experience. I want someone to share the way that I share in that I have to talk it out to think it through and know I am not crazy. Are you coming down hot as I have thought about it. It's in September, right? Mm-hmm. On the 9th. And I'm going to Salem in June. So this might be like the witchiest year of my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's three twos, which is six, which is my lucky number. And then if you do do six by two, it's three, which is another lucky number. I think you should go. Oh, you're you're into the numbers? I don't know. I'm crazy. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Glad we clarified. I, I make I, I make things up, and if it, it it fits my need, then I say yes. I like this. That's how I do everything. <laughs> <laughs> what brings you the most joy in your practice? Definitely childlike wonder feeling. Definitely that feeling of holy crud, that just happened. I can't deny that. I am not alone here. I'm part of this larger magical puzzle, but you just gave me a surge, whoever you are, wherever you are, saying, I need you part of this. And that is definitely the most joy. What would you tell somebody just starting out? To anyone just starting out, I would say, don't get overwhelmed out there. You really only need three spells, three good spells that you can manipulate in any single way you want, and three herbs. There is so much hype around all sorts of stuff you need. Now, today, I find so much more draw in working with things around me than maybe I did 15 years ago where it was like, oh, this person's working with this herb or this resin or this crystal and like I got to find a way to find it. And that's, that's not how it works. Like you have so much power within you and you have so much power around you, like watching you, growing with you and learning with you. You just need to get out there and see it. With that said, if buying a badass cauldron or a medieval athame makes you feel witchier and magical in the moment, do it. I have those pieces that just, I pick them up and I'm like, yeah, you're doing this. This is witchcraft. You're going to kill it today. (laughs) And that's okay. But I think when you're actually working with You know, it's your stage. Your altar is your stage. You're here. You're you're working up the crowd. You're getting them excited. You do have to have a couple good props or they're going to know that's a fake leg laying on the ground. Like you need to have a real leg sometimes in your practice. Okay, maybe leg is a bad example here. Uh, Flowers? I don't know. I'm going to have to really meditate on that later. Um, (laughs) But... Yeah, I mean, if having something shiny or another example is like a mirror, there's a lot of people freaking out about mirrors and it being bad. Like I work with two mirrors in front of me all the time. As soon as someone online is like, "Ah, you can't have it against your bed. I was like, I've had one against my bed for years, but now I'm looking behind me in my bed thinking there's going to be a shadow person. Like do what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy, but don't go crazy or you're going to go broke. Just work with what's around you. It will present itself. It always does. It's not always in the form in which you think, but it will be the most powerful materials and tools that you've ever experienced in your life. What do you dislike about the witch community? Hmm. If there is anything. If there's not, tell me what you love. I feel like there was something I was thinking about earlier. Um, I would say 
there's kind of an off balance in the witch community right now. So it's very heavily on gatekeepers and it is very heavily on new people. And it's causing this major off balance where people like me in my experience where I'm just like, hey, I've just been here a while. I don't really want to be in the spotlight, but I'm not really the all powerful seeing and knowing Oz. Where do I fit in? And uh, it's just a lot of drama. Um, the scammers are crazy. The people are arguing over all sorts of things. And really, we just need to be kinder to each other and supportive. Why do you care so much about what kind of salt somebody uses in their practice? <laughs> you know, <laughs> black salt, pink salt, white salt, kosher salt, salt lick. I don't know. Like, who cares? Like, they're sourcing what is near them or what works for them. Like, you do you, boo. What is happening sometimes? What do you love? Definitely the communities I've found. They're smaller communities, but they feel very safe. Everybody's very receptive. I belong to a coven. It's called the Dirty Ho Coven. We're a bunch of gardening witches. And that was something I really was looking forward to in 2020 was make, making actual witch friends. And I had no idea how many people actually just wanted to be friends with me too. So uh, it, just looking in the right spots and finding your place and not trying to push a puzzle piece into the wrong puzzle. Like if it doesn't feel good, it's not for you. Um, I'm not going to name ones that didn't fit right, but they're, I guess I can give an example. So there's there's a lot of Appalachian witchcraft groups and they are throwing psalms out there and Corinthians and, you know, the Bible is basically their grimoire. Doesn't work for me. I was stuck around a long time because I liked the old wives tales, the good luck and the bad luck charms. Like those things kind of made me feel like home and made me connect with like my family a little bit better and remembering those things. But I finally was like, just because this is in your handle, do you need to be in this group? Just because it's where you live, do you need to be in this group? This is not your thing. And so I got out of there, which was much better for me. <laughs> but yeah, finding your community and sticking to your guns. You don't have to like it because everybody else likes it. Just do what works for you. Yeah, I can't get with the whole Bible thing either. I have some relatives that I knew were very strong Christian practitioners. I did not realize that they were like standing on the tiptoes of the pulpit, pointing fingers to the heavens and down to the ground until my boompa's funeral, which is my father's father. And all I could do was feel him like shaking and quaking because that was the last thing he wanted to like have everybody have at his funeral after the way he just went through his life with his reverend father. Like I was really floored and I looked at that entire side of the family and they're all raising a hand and amen and shaking the heads. And I was like, this is not for me. I am glad that works for them. This is not for me. <laughs> Is there anything you wish was discussed more often in the wish community? Experiences. Um, I did touch on that earlier. I really want to know people's experiences. And there are some, maybe, sure, that's for you. But there's got to be some kind of minute something where it's, even if it's a witch fail, like, share it. If you lit yourself on fire, great. I'd like to know. So I'm not the only one. If you made a tincture and it went sour because you forgot to seal it, share it. We all learn from each other. But there's also validation. Um, and I really didn't understand the importance of that truly until I started doing these workshops with other people where in my head I was like, previously, I was just thinking that and then it happened. Was I or was it some kind of glitch in the matrix? Like you have those questions sometimes. Then other times it's like, it's absolutely undeniable. 
but nobody else will know that because they can't hear inside my head. Just the validation of having someone else practicing with me and them saying, look, you're not far off on the track. I just want to let you know, you keep going, you keep telling me what's happening. And I would th put things out there and then we'd review it at the end. And I was just blown away, blown away. Super, super important to know that your experiences are similar to others. You're not just reading in a book and thinking, why don't I have a practice this magical? Why am I not having experiences like this? Like have real tangible pros and cons and goof ups with each other. Not just the experience. I want an experience. Don't tell me how experienced you are or how to do something a certain way. Tell me about your journey. That's kind of why I ask the questions I do and have the guests on here that I do. What, what motivates that? nosiness <laughs> who are the big who or what are the three biggest influences on your practice <laughs> oh well since you're being nosy i'm just kidding I would say, <laughs> hey, aren't we all nosy? Isn't that why our libraries mm -hmm. are so big and we're on all these different <laughs> platforms trying to find things out about each other? If we didn't want to know about each other's lives, social media wouldn't exist. A TMZ wouldn't exist. Precisely. So my three big influences, I would say number one is that first book that got you into the craft. Absolutely. Hands down, that's the one that reeled you in. Um, for me, that was Teen Witch. And I still have that copy. I have lost many things over the years, moving or kind of putting witchcraft in my back pocket for a little bit. But now that one's like heart and soul memories. I can still smell the pages when they're fresh. And every time I pick up another book that smells like it, I get that feeling again. Nature especially. I have a real primal pull to nature. And so there are certain times, especially in the golden hour, that like, I swear, if I could turn into a werewolf or a panther, I'd be running through the forest. So I definitely get that surge and feel from nature inspiration. And then Third, I would say, is definitely the communities. I can't emphasize that enough. You're not alone, no matter how remote on an island you are in a conservative area or without, you know, a supportive family. There is family online and it might take you a year or two to sort out some of the bad eggs, but don't give up because super important to have community even if it's not a witchy community but a crafting if you're a knitter if you're a gardener a lot of things stem from there and you'd be surprised who comes out of the closet once you get to talking to a bunch of them who else would you like to see on the show i would like to see on the show tanya brown and tanya brown is the editor and creator of Which Way Magazine, and she's one of my most favorite people. Um, she has a psychology background, so I like that she comes to the table with uh, a very grounded approach um, and thinks of the mundane first, um, because there's no reason to freak out. Some things we can explain right away. Some things are just emotions or physical traumas that we need to do, and it's not something we should be handling through witchcraft. It should be with help, um, sometimes medications or therapy, things like that. So I, I love that she comes from that area of the witchy spectrum first, but she's just got so much 
I don't know. Every time I listen to Tanya or talk to her, it's like sitting at a table, having tea with her. Sometimes a cat interrupts or someone's building outside and it wouldn't be any different than me talking to one of my friends on the phone. And I love that. I love that I get a quick little daily check in with her and she's got a terrific magazine um, and lots of great collaborators, you know, writing articles and photos for her magazine. That's the first mag- magazine, which magazine I bought and the only one I've s- subscribed to. And I'm, I've been oh. subscribed to it since I found it. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. I love her. Yes, I want her too. <laughs> so we're at the, the end of the surprises, which everybody knows basically, but <laughs> <laughs> please recommend something to the listeners. Okay, so I would like to recommend a band. The band is called Kudu, sometimes referred to in Scottish as Kudov, and it's spelled C-U space D-U-B-H. They are a bagpipe band, but they're super eclectic. There is an album literally for every person I know. If you're a belly dancer, there's one for you. If you're into ska, there's one for you. If you're into metal, there's one for you. There's even one with um, indigenous medicine men that is extremely spiritual. They allowed them into the circle to play bagpipes with their war drums. But every time, you know, I, I put it on, I can't stop moving. I am amped. I am full of energy. And I know a lot of people are always looking for other ways to like raise energy. Um, sometimes you don't need coffee if you play early in the morning like I did this morning. You can ask my husband. You just need bagpipes. But it is phenomenal. And <laughs> They are also at most Renaissance festivals across the nation, so you may have the opportunity to see them in person. Um, This year, Piper Alley, who is very infamous on Instagram, toured with them. So if you follow her, you can get a taste of her as well. I'm not affiliated. I'm just a huge fan in their musical energy. Cool. Cool. Now, would you please tell me a story that you love to tell? Okay. So back to validation, I could not think of a story that I tell all the time, namely because as I mentioned earlier, I don't like to repeat myself. (laughs) It's really arrogant. I know, but it just, uh, I don't, I don't repeat myself a lot. So I was struggling. I was struggling. And last night, I said, all right, universe, just freaking tell me a story that I should tell on this podcast tomorrow. I'm running out of time. And this gal who I have not talked to in years messages me on Facebook and says, here's a photo that reminded me of you in this picture that I remember of you as a kid. And I was like, so random. Like, she doesn't like any of my posts. She's a friend of my father, like, or she's the daughter of my father's best friend, but I really don't associate with her. We have nothing in common. And here she is with this message. Okay, universe, I hear you loud and clear. (laughs) So the story I kind of want to tell is um, the magical tales of my father's blue van from the 90s. (laughs) (laughs) That's already amazing. It's one of these vans, you know, like a work van. It has the big rolling door and there's nothing in the back. And looking back, there are just so many adventures. Um, But this one story this gal had referenced, we were coming back from the Outer Banks and uh, there's no chairs in the back. And at this time I had one other sibling, a bunch of luggage, and my dad thought, all right, well, I'll just put folding lawn chairs in the back and the kids can sit on those for the six hour drive wow so we're in traffic and this big 1970s station wagon slammed into the back of us and so my chair flew back and because people carried cameras all the time way back when my mother turned around and took snaps of it so i have all these great pictures of my brother laughing I'm on my back. My legs are in the air. 
So it was just like one example of this magical blue van experience. And it evolved over time. Eventually you put in this big piece of plywood and attached some luxury chairs that like laid back. So when we took our long trips to Florida, we could lay in there and he put in a VHS and TV combination in there. Oh, y'all were so, fancy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was really, we had no money. We were dirt poor. My parents traded for everything, but we had no idea that we were broke growing up. And it was really a magical experience. But um, another magical experience of the van was that we took a boat that my father had traded and gotten at some point to a local prominent river. And on the way back, um, they had the windows down and this like pigeon flies in the window as we're passing under a bridge, smacks into my mother's face, <laughs> flops in the back. It's on my foot and I'm going, it's on my foot. It's on my foot. And my brother is crying next to me because he doesn't know what to do. It flies up onto my father's shoulder. who's driving and he just, he just looks like a pirate, right? And he's trying to unroll his window because they're not with a button. You have to manually roll down the window with this bird on his shoulder, flies out the window. We're all sighing. My mom's like, oh my gosh, my face. I need an ice pack from the cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all like taking this deep breath and this car pulls up as we're driving. And he's like, you know, your bird just flew out the window, right? And we're like, it's not a pet. It's not a pet. <laughs> so... <laughs> Just lots of really magical experiences from birds to car crashes where it's like, we were safe. This thing was a tank. You know, I have great moments of Bon Jovi playing in there, cranking me up and amping me up for softball games. It's just like the magic blue van. I miss that thing. And that is my story today. That's my new favorite. <laughs> That's my new favorite. <laughs> well, I'll let the gal who messaged me on Facebook know. <laughs> y'all know y'all's bird got out? Yeah. Like, <laughs> just lost your bird. <laughs> really, we had no freaking clue. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> chest well thanks for being on the show oh thanks for having me it was a lot of fun i will see you over on instagram then all right now bye bye i got another review and i gotta say that it makes me so excited to get reviews because it's still baffling to me that people actually want to listen to this much less take the time to write a review, and I appreciate every one. This one is from Sarah, and Sarah says, Love story time. Oh, this one is from Amazon. I love how every episode is like story time with a friend. Well, thanks for being on the show. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. I will see you over on Instagram then. <laughs> All right now. Bye. Bye. I got another review and I gotta say that it makes me so excited to get reviews because it's still baffling to me that people actually want to listen to this. Much less take the time to write a review and I appreciate every one. This one is from Sarah and Sarah says, love story time. Oh, this one is from Amazon. I love how every episode is like story time with a friend. Kim has a great way of pulling out those funny little tidbits that let you really connect with a person to understand and see where they're coming from. I'm always so excited when I see a new episode drop because it means I get to meet an incredible new witchy person. Thank you, Sarah. That is so kind of you to say. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast, Twitter at Average Witch Pod. Facebook at facebook.com slash your average witch podcast at your average witch dot com and at your favorite podcast service. Want to help the podcast grow? Leave a review. You can review us on Amazon and Apple Podcasts, and now you can rate us on Spotify. 
you just might hear your review read at the end of the next episode. To rate Your Average Witch on Spotify, click the home key, click on Your Average Witch podcast, and then leave a rating. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com slash cleverkimscurios. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise on the podcast, send an email to youraveragewitchpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the moon changes. <laughs>